Hello, everyone. My name is Ian Rowe. And I'm Nike Fajors. And welcome to The Invisible Men, where we make the achievements of incredible men invisible no more. Hello. My name is Ian Rowe, and I'm a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Hello, I'm Nike Fajors, a member of the Leadership Network at AEI. And welcome to a new episode of The Invisible Men, where Nike and I uh, we try to introduce some amazing guys who you may not uh, have heard of, but are doing some pretty interesting things. And today, we have Yaya Fanusi. Hello, Yaya. How are you? Hi, Invisible Men. I can see you. Uh, I'm glad glad to be be an Invisible Man myself. G- yes, well, <laughs> Good the to whole meet you. goal is to make it so that you are invisible no more. <laughs> right? Very good. Um, so Yaya is a former CIA analyst and a national security expert on finance technology. So you'll be able to talk to us about what China is doing, what's going on with Bitcoin, which I can't wait to dive into. Uh, But first, you know, just to get set up, just tell us a little bit about your backstory and any Mm. sort of defining moments that you had in your life before you, you know, joined the CIA. Wow. Um, Yeah, absolutely. Happy to. I think I've had a lot of defining moments. Um, I mean, a little bit of context and background in terms of my origin story. Um, You know, I come from um, a father and a mother that met in the in the 70s. My dad is actually from West Africa. He's from Sierra Leone. He came over to the United States in 1967, the height of the Black Power movement, the you know post-colonial independence movements in Africa. He came and he was, uh, he was uh, you know, let's just say that um, his Black Panther friends thought he was ra- radical. <laughs> he, you know, that's, that's how he came to the United States. And the funny story is, you know, you know, the way he tells it, he said that um, the U.S. Embassy had a role in him coming to America because they because the Soviets were trying to recruit him. You know, all the young, you know, young, you know, Africans mm-hmm. and they were trying to recruit him. And, and he said someone from the embassy, embassy said, uh, we can't have this guy go to the Soviets. Let's bring him to America. Wow. <laughs> that, that, that's 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 the story. That's the story that, that I've heard. Um, but he came here f- for college and met my mom. My mom is, uh, you know, African-American and uh, grew up mostly in Los Angeles. And they met and had me. And so I grew up in California, um, mostly in Southern California. Um, I lived in a variety of neighborhoods. I lived in South Central for a brief time uh, with my grandmother. And then uh, we moved out to the San Fernando Valley in a mostly uh, black and Latino neighborhood. Um, It's kind of suburbs, but but, um, sort of like, you know, like I said, a black and Latino neighborhood. And um, yeah, some highlights, some things that impacted me in my life. Um, I mean, you, you know, that's a little bit of my parental background. But I was, um, you know, I was always a, a curious, creative kid, I think. Um, I um, Highlights. One, when, when I was six, we moved to Nigeria for one year. And I got to uh-huh. live in, you know, I got to live in Nigeria for, for that time. And that sort of exposed me to the rest of the world, right? I, we, had, uh, we were in Oakland. And then we moved to Zaria, Nigeria, in northern Nigeria, and then moved to South Central LA. And so that was kind of like I was just seeing all these different different uh, environments. Um, and then again, grew up in California, and a big uh, some impacts by high school. Um, I would say the biggest influence, like many, this was the late '80s, early '90s. Um, and I know we're gonna have. I know you have a hip hop question. Um, so I grew up in the golden age of hip hop. I was, you know really 1989. I mean, I was, you know, it was when hip hop really started to speak to me. And I was influenced by the, the, the trend in hip hop that impacted a lot of black youth at the time, which was, you know, really this, the, the, not only the social consciousness, you know, definitely the sort of um, Afrocentric black nationalist militancy, right? This in the, in the, in the late eighties and early nineties is rebirth, right? You know, do the right thing, public enemy, you know, th- that, that was, that's what had fight me come of age, fight, you know, fight the power. Right. I mean, that, that was me. Um, you know, in high school, I was the high school um, uh, black student union president. Um, and so that was, you know, I, I, that was my consciousness at, at the time. Um, and, and it was interesting because it was a very um, intellectually, that's what impacted me. Um, it wasn't very spiritual. I know we're going to get maybe into, you know, religion and spirituality later. It was really like reading Malcolm X the first time. It was all about the, so the political side, the social commentary. Um, 
And um, yeah, that sort of drove me. And, and I would say I had a bit of a transition because later in college, I think, um, you know, I matured and we can get into what happened and all these different things. But, you know, um, I had a spiritual sort of journey that I went on. I later converted to Islam because, you know, my, you know, anyway, I could convert it to Islam, became Muslim. Uh, and so, again, that was sort of an, a, diff- a whole journey itself. Um, and I decided to major in economics. Um, at the time, I was really interested in the connection between economic development here in the U.S. and in Africa. And so I had uh, actually had a double major. It was economics, but then I majored in like an interdisciplinary uh, field where I had the opportunity to do a thesis on comparing youth involved in community economic development in rural Zimbabwe with the United States. And I looked at the case study of the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative in Boston, Roxbury, mm-hmm. um, look, comparing that and how youth were involved in that with some youth. I, um, I visited Zimbabwe. I went to spend about six weeks in Zimbabwe in 1996, and I spent time with this carpentry group that was helping like these uh, youth that had left school, helping them gain income. And so all of my, even though I was an economics major, all of my work, work study, you know, after school programs, I was doing a lot of tutoring, mentoring. Um, I taught one summer in the freedom schools in West Oakland back in the, in the early nineties, West, these uh, acorn projects. And so I was always interested in education, even though I never took an education course. So College was a time when I think all those issues, those sort of issues of like, you know, the situation of black people, the situation in Africa, practically I dealt with them by teaching and mentoring, seeing, you know, working with our youth. And um, that sort of influence, that sort of, we can get into this, but that gave me a more practical sense of what does the African-American community really need? You know, there were things that happened. I went to UC Berkeley. Um, there were things that happened like the, the controversy over affirmative action. And I had, I had a different take on that, you know, than most would expect. And, I, you know, I'll tease that for now. But I started to think about things differently as I, as I saw what people were, fi- were shouting about. Out, but and then I compared that to what I assessed that the African American community really needed, especially with education. Um, long story short, um, I lay, after I graduated, I went to Ghana on the Fulbright scholarship to do another sort of study, and this dealt with um, with education as well. I went you know, teacher teacher incentives in rural areas. I spent a year in Ghana, and I had converted to Islam. So interestingly, I spent my first year as a Muslim in Ghana, and I made the Hajj while I was there because I was so close. I said, "Hey, wow. let me make the pilgrimage." Mabro, Mabro. So, thank you, thank you. Um, as we as we talk during the last few days of Ramadan, as we do do this interview, um, but 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 I guess I'll stop because I know I've been going on. And, and in terms of the highlights, the, you know, my journey is one of I, I put it like this because this I think relates to what we see in the world today. I, as a teenager, I came of age really with the sort of race consciousness was race first. And I would say I had this over infatuation with blackness. And, you know, it was a bit militant of reflecting a lot of the music at the time. And um, it was almost like blackness was my that was my, you know, that was my soul. That was everything. It was kind of yeah, it was my identity, how I judged everything. And it was the maturing with education and working with our youth and then also and traveling to Africa because you go to Africa and you see the conditions and then you realize what you have here. You know, I had one situation where in, in rural Zimbabwe, I walked with these ki- these students that had to walk literally two hours to school in the morning and literally two hours back because there were few schools. And, and when they got to the school, it was run down, chalkboards, dilapidated. And so and then I come back to the Bay Area. I come back to Berkeley for my last year at Berkeley. And I came back from Zimbabwe with a more reflective sort of mood. Um, I, I stopped doing a lot of the things. I used to do like poetry, spoken word slams and stuff. And I sort of stopped that. I had a radio show. And I came back with more of like an internal you know, in an internal reflective mood. And, um, and that somehow led me to sort of this religious transformation. Um, but the, the icing, not icing on the cake, but the thing I will, I'll say about the highlight is that, so I had a, 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 an evolution, right, in my thinking, because the spirituality made me question a lot of the sort of race-based thinking I had and in a lot of the political ideas I had. So, you know, it, religion should hopefully make you get more universal, right? You're thinking about eternal, you know, eternal principles and universal principles. So, so I, I had to, qu- I questioned, even the reading of scripture made me question my, like, race-based um, uh, preferences, you know, you know, you, know the, you read scripture that talks about how, you know, you know God views 
you based on your righteousness, not your color, right? Like those are the principles. And so I had to question the fact that, that I used to think that, you know, hey, I used to judge my color. Like, hey, I'm this because I'm black and black is, you know, I mean, really is almost like black supremacy in a sense. Mm -hmm. And um, I questioned a lot of those things. And, um, and eventually, which we, I know we're not going to get into the professional stuff just yet, but eventually as a Muslim you know, um, African American. I later got into the world of intelligence, um, but before I did, I actually taught for a few years at, in Washington D.C. So that's a whole other story, a little bit all over the map, but <laughs> but that's a bit of a nutshell. You know, I just want to I want to go back a bit because I'm I'm really intrigued. That was a wonderful introduction with a lot of lessons for our viewers. Mm -hmm. But in terms of being having the West African father and the African-American mother. Did you feel a greater comfort when you were in Africa than in some of these historic African-American communities or vice versa? Hmm. It, was, it was interesting because I had, well, one, I had some, con not connection. I mean, obviously I had a connection because um, my father was West African. Now I went to, 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 to really give you the, the, the funny story. So my dad came over in 67 and he said it was like a, a Fulbright related grant that brought him here. So I got the Fulbright to go to Sierra Leone. But a month or two before I was supposed to go, and this was my dream, because by college, I was like, you know, I really wanted to go to the continent. I visited Zimbabwe. You know, I really I had also visited the Caribbean. So I was really into like the whole diaspora reconnecting. Um, but the war broke out uh, a coup. There was another coup in Sierra Leone. So they said I couldn't go. Um, I, I think my identity was one where it was unique. I think when I was in the U.S., I mean, I had the, my mom's influence. You know, they always say that you kind of get the culture of your mother. So even though my dad was African, I mean, you know, he 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 was kind of my, my dad was unique. Like he wasn't your typical African. He was kind of like he 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 marched to his own drummer. So I was mostly around the African American community. And I I felt like comfortable. That was what I was raised. That's that's what I knew. Obviously, there was a little bit of a twist because I had an African dad. So that that was a twist. When I went to Ghana and Africa, I would say it it. I felt comfortable because I was so open to reconnecting with the, with, you know, with Africa. Um, but I will say one thing that I noticed, and this is may, I don't know if this answer gets to your question, but I, when I went to Ghana, I actually connected with a lot of, well, not a lot, but with, with a number of um, African-American, like, you know, black folks in America, expats. And I noticed one thing, and this, I hope this doesn't offend people who have gone back to Africa and, 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 but, but I'm just going to say it, say what I, please, what I feel. Please. So by this time, right, I had converted to Islam. This was, you know, I, I went to Ghana and I noticed something about a lot of my brothers and sisters who were African-American who then went to Ghana and, or Africa. Some of them who had rejected because of race, because of their experience in America. I had, I knew one guy who, um, he was actually Muslim, I believe, a convert who, who left um, America after the Rodney King verdict. And he was like, I'm done, I'm going to Ghana. Um, a little fact, Rodney King was beat a few blocks from my house. And wow. I, I was 16 or, I guess I was 16 when that happened. And another interesting fact, I mean, I know exactly where that was. Um, when I saw the footage on the news, you know, there's the timestamp on the video, the famous video. I remember I saw it, you know, like a few days later on the news when I first, when I first heard about it. And I looked at the timestamp and I, I noticed that, hey, that night, I was driving the same freeway because I used to have a job at the mall, you know, uh, just like a little, you know, retail job at the mall. And I was like, Wait, that I was on the exact same freeway that, that they chased him on. Um, now, I wasn't high on PCP or anything like that. But um, but anyway, uh, but I digress. So the Rodney King beating impacted me, right? The idea of, of police brutality, right? This it's like I feel like I'm living in this echo of where we are today because a lot of those same themes and how I reacted to them. Yeah. Right. I reacted to I mean, obviously, there was a lot of police brutality in, in L.A. It was pretty infamous. A lot there was there was racism. I mean, L.A. had a lot of issues. LAPD had a lot of issues. And and so a lot of the so I understand even the rhetoric that we're hearing today, but I've uh, but I think I have a unique a unique view because I remember it from there. I see how things have developed. I, I have a different take on how things are happening today compared to what sort of the media is saying. Um, but anyway, I'm getting back to the African-American expats. So this is something I don't share much, but I notice a lot of people I've met 
it was like they African Americans who had gone to Africa a lot of times because they they were done with America, right? They 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 were done with America and they felt that they could find something in Ghana and in Africa. And I I, I just felt that a lot of times those folks weren't at peace. Mm. So they had left America and gone and it, and but it's like something I sense it was like there was still something that that they just weren't at peace it doesn't mean being African American or Black American united peace it was something specific it was like I felt a certain like they haven't found peace even though they're here and to me what what that what I realized was like if you don't find peace within yourself no matter what the societal circumstances you're not going to find it going somewhere else you know if you can't find peace in your surround peace in your identity where you are if you feel conflict you go somewhere else because you think that oh there's not gonna be racism there so i'm gonna finally feel i i i know they were happy because they were around black people and they didn't have some of the outward racism but it just but it to me it was a lesson that we got to find peace within ourselves we got to find peace when it's when it, within our identity we have to you can't be you can't not love who you are and love your full identity and then find peace going somewhere else that's external to you wow. um that was that was just an observation um that i had just from from that yeah wow yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm sorry i'm going no 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 no, no 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 that that's that's some deep stuff so okay so then so then take us continue on to your journey because how does cia <laughs> <laughs> connect to all of this right that would if you knew me if anyone knew me in high school i would be the last person to join the cia right i mean i, I mean come on i was the guy with the malcolm x shirts black hat medallion you know um and i was very i mean not not i, I mean that's a bit of a caricature but i mean i really did have a, a maturation right because and this is not this is not to i, I think i have a certain not respect, but a certain understanding of the sort of the wokeness that's around us, because, you know, I don't want to, you know, put people down because I understand the mentality. Right. Um, and a lot of people who meant like people who I you know, love and uh, who mentored me. Right. Were very, very political, very militant. And and I had a chance to grow through through a lot of that to question things to question stuff of mainstream society so i don't want to like down what what where people are um but what happened was you know i had this sort of the spiritual thing of thinking le differently about race that was the first thing right thinking differently about race and that got me to i think um again, think more universally, spiritually, right? So I'm thinking about Islam and I'm thinking about how can I be a better Muslim? How can I be a better human? So that was the first thing. Uh, and then the second thing was my actual growth. Um, oh, what I mentioned about education, you know, seeing that the, the solution to, to the, the African-American problem in America, in America was not external. It was like, you know, here's the, the take the affirmative action thing. Affirmative action, you know, the reaction when Prop 209 came down in California and, you know, they said, okay, we're not going to do racial preferences. And most of, a lot of my colleagues and friends were, of course, up in arms. It was like, no, this is an assault on, you know, African-American progress, et cetera, et cetera. And as, as sort of militant as I was and as sort of, you know, sort of like, you know, as I was, you know, raising the fist as I was, as I thought about it, I was like, but you know, you know, as I'm dealing with these youth and all the tutoring and going to the schools and mentorship programs, affirmative action isn't really helping these kids. It's not helping them develop the skills. Like if we want the numbers, because we were all concerned that the numbers were going to drop, which they did at, at UC Berkeley and throughout other parts of the UC system, the University of California system. But in the, I was thinking that, well, what we need is to give these students better skills, prepare them, even SAT prep, like all these things. So I just started to think differently than just the knee jerk reaction of just, you know, the very sort of left, left talking, leftist talking points about how black people can survive. And with the CIA, I mean, it's it's a, it's a bit of a longer story because, I, yeah, I. Even when I got the opportunity to work at the CIA, it wasn't an instant. What had happened in, let's say, the late 90s to the early 2000s was, you know, I had grown as a as a Muslim. Um, actually, let me put it. Let me 
give my wife some props because my wife, I met my wife in grad school and she's, um, she had a different experience. Like I converted to Islam. She's African American, but she came from the experience where her parents in the sixties and seventies joined the nation of Islam. And then, you know, then transitioned when Elijah Muhammad died in 75, his uh, son took over, ma'am, um, Wallace D. Muhammad or Worth Dean Muhammad. And the Islam that that community then took on when they left the NOI was, you know, the idea of not only universal, you know, Islam universally, but they also, um, the understanding was that the, the Muslim identity c can embrace, can embrace America and that even African-Americans should embrace their citizenship. And I'll be honest, you know, so I, when I first kind of got exposed to that, I was like, that's not, I don't know about all that. You know, I mean, I was still kind of like, well, you still know, I was still militant a little, you know, even though I was a little bit more universal, but I was like, yeah. And I'll give you, I'll give you a good, this is a good anecdote. You have time for a quick anecdote that. Yeah, sure. could, um, so I'll never forget there were, this was, I was in grad school. I've been Muslim like maybe about a year and a half, two years. And, um, um, there was an Islamic convention. This was the African-American Muslim community that was really associated with Elijah Muhammad's son, W.D. Muhammad. And they were having a convention and the convention was in L.A. I was in New York at grad school, but I went to um, like a lot of different mosques. They would have a like a video link of the you know, keynote speech of the convention. And it was in L.A. And here I was in uh, in New York and um you know, Imam, you know, Imam Worth Dean Muhammad had, he was the, key, you know, the keynote speaker and he had on the, uh, as guests, cause this was like a big deal. It's an annual convention. And Afri these are all African-American Muslims mostly. And one of the guests was the, the LAPD police chief. And it was just like, you know, welcome him, you know, and, and, and I remember I was sitting there, I was like, what? LAPD? <laughs> Yo, you, come on, man. You, come on. The LAPD isn't our friend. And so, you know, that was what I was thinking. But um, as time went on, I think I matured because the idea was that, look, okay, America has changed. You can't deny. And this happened in the 70s where we're sort of, you know, Imam Muhammad said this in that community. They were like, look, America has changed drastically from the 50s to the 70s. You know, there is a, first of all, the principles of the, of the Constitution and of America's founding actually gel and are totally in line with the key principles, mm -hmm. you know, Islamic principles. So you shouldn't feel rejection of, you shouldn't reject America or its founding, et cetera. And so the idea was that, so the logic is that, this place is a home for us. We've built it as, as black folks here and that we should, you, 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 all, you will only be a second class citizen unless you embrace the identity of being American and the citizenship that you have. That was the logic that this community Very was. Profound. Yeah. And the thing was that that was to me was a trip was that I reflected on this later. Again, not to point at different groups and make this like about that group or this girl, but I'm just trying to be objective. As someone who grew up with like an African-American focus and sort of black militancy, as I grew into this other take on what it means to be black in America and, and to be a Muslim, I realized I was like, why is it that this um, articulation of black in America and Muslim in America is 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 eclipsed by the more sort of radical and militant um, narrative that you hear about from quote unquote black Muslims. How come, you, you know, because when that shift happened, you know, again, not to single people out, but like, you know, when that shift happened, most of the followers of the nation of Islam followed Worth Dean Muhammad, like the, the most of them. It was only a small section that kind of, you know, went back with Farrakhan and sort of restarted the race based ideology of the uh, NOI. But growing up in the 80s and 90s, you only heard about Farrakhan as black Muslims. You only heard that like, that was the thing. And I realized that, huh. So, you know, I guess the media kind of likes to promote what is controversial, even yeah. if it's not the majority opinion. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so my wife came out of that community, came out of, you know, Imam Worthy Muhammad's community. And I had um, even before I met my wife, I kind of gravitated towards that. And that's the the background as to why when I met a recruiter and he said, would you even would, would you consider working for the CIA? It was because I had had this work, this background, this sort of shifting idea about America that I answered. I said, I hadn't really thought about that, but wow. I'm open to it. No, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that you spotlighted uh, W.D. Muhammad's contributions to America and to, to Islam. It's, you're right. I mean, 
I don't have the stats, but I'd argue at any one point, the Nation of Islam may have had 15,000 members and W.D. Muhammad had 300,000. Yeah, and yet, to your that. point, the only one that got on the Donahue show or on Oprah or on Nightline mm -hmm. was the other individual, which is troubling. No question about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, it, and it's a big lesson for today about, again, not to pick particular groups or leaders, but that what you see reflected in media in terms of personalities, in terms of, quote unquote, leaders um, and, and activity within the black community um, is not does not always represent where most people are and what's happening, uh -oh. even the, the good work that's happening on the ground. Wow. So, so before we go to the speed round, so what exactly did you do for the CIA? <laughs> okay. No, so, I'm just curious. Yeah. So, yeah, I was an analyst, right? So I was, you know, I was, uh, you know, uh, uh, open, open employee, right? I wasn't, uh, you know, an undercover uh, employee. Um, I that's, was, what, that's what all the undercover people say. <laughs> 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 well, uh, but, but but that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, <laughs> um, but I was hired, interestingly, as an economic analyst to cover um, threats uh, relating to corruption and energy for the most part. So I was hired because that was my background. Like, yeah, I was Muslim and they knew I was Muslim. I mean, I had on my application, you know, all the places I had traveled and I said, I've been to Mecca, you know, so they knew I was Muslim. Um, but they hired me to 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 look at economic issues. And I was there for about a year and a half. Well, even before that, I, I decided I actually wanted to cover counterterrorism. So I, um, after about almost two years, I became a counterterrorism analyst. And I focused on, you know, covering threats and trying to counter threats from Al Qaeda and Al Qaeda sort of related extremist, violent extremist groups. So I did, you know, I did basic stuff. I mean, the, the, you know, there's stuff I can talk about because, you know, some of it I've written about and, and I've gotten it approved to be able to talk about it. But, you know, um, you know, certain, um, you know, basically Al Qaeda plotting um, and other and even just providing some insights into sort of how Al Qaeda figures were trying to recruit, uh, even how they were trying to recruit, um, you know, Westerners and, and folks in the U.S. Like that was something that I that I dealt with um, because I was influenced by the fact that the London. So more than the 9-11 bombing, which happened before I was in government, I was a teacher when 9-11 happened. When I was like my first six months in, in the agency, in CIA, I was, um, uh, the London bombing happened, July 7th, the London Underground. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. That, that really impacted me from the sense of that those operatives were not your typical, they, they were not like the foreign operatives that 9-11 were, right? From Morocco and Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Those were four individuals that were, um, British raised and mostly British born. In fact, one was a, a Jamaican convert, UK. These were UK for the most UK citizens. And when that happened, I, was, I said to myself, wow, I mean, they were young too. And I was like, that, I, I understand that identity. Now, you know, not that I understand being a terrorist, but I understand being a Westerner. I understand what, um, narratives and propaganda you you get especially if you're you're young and f having this fervor about this religion and how you can sort of warp or get a warped picture of what it means to be a muslim in a western society so i thought you know what let me use my let me do what i can to to fight terrorism and so for the most part i was a counterterrorism analyst yeah yeah before we get to the speed run i want to ask you one more question related to the cia and that is yeah. Would the CIA be a great career for, for our Daryl, the 16-year-old team? You know, obviously in the African-American community, historically the CIA, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you think about Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and Patrice Lumumba, I don't know what the truth is. I don't know what the, the falsehoods are, but mm -hmm. the reputation historically has not been great. Now, of course, 2021, I'm sure the CIA is different than it was in 1959, but how do you think about the CIA as a career for, for young Daryl in Forgotten USA? There's a lot I could say, say, say about that. So, yeah, you first you acknowledge there was a, a turbulent time in our country and elsewhere, you know, in the 60s, institutions of power were not used properly. Um, yeah, there's a bad legacy. Um, but I'll say a couple of things. One, I will say what the so the person who gave me a recruiter, a recruiter's card to the CIA was an African-American. He was a diplomat that was at Howard University, um, African-American brother. And he said, have you ever considered working for the CIA? And the, you know what he said? He said, because he saw my skepticism. He said, <laughs> um, 
there are a lot of brothers working at the at the agency. It's not your father's CIA anymore. <laughs> that's what he said. And that that's again, this is coming from another African American. So yep. that made me like think, okay, you know what? Let let me at least hear him out. Let me let me at least call the person and and see. And but I'll say to Daryl, I'd say that first of all, you have to think about what what does it mean? What does national security mean? National security is only a, the logical conclusion of securing your family, your neighborhood, of securing the safety of your neighborhood. So if you're support, if you think that the people in your community and neighborhood need to be safe and you don't want bad stuff to happen to them, it's the same with the state, your state, and it's the same with your nation. And you know, intelligence work is really about securing the secu- you know, about the security of, of the people and of, of the people around you and the people in your nation. And that embracing citizens, citizenship basically means that, that, that we're, that you have to be, you, you take ownership of the security of your surroundings. And I would also say you have to think about it. Like a lot of people point to the election of President Obama as a bit, as a milestone, which it was, but you have to also consider, right? If African Amer- if an African American can be president, right? That means that you're going to be over the CIA, right? It means that you're representing people and you're representing them. You should represent them with your morality, with the wisdom, with you know, with the principles of our founding, and that you know the CIA is you know unlike other societies where the intelligence community can run unchecked and there are no mm-hmm. accountabilities. So here's one thing I learned from working at the agency at the CIA. Every society and, and just observing human history, the issue is not abuse of power. Abuse of power happens. You know that. I mean, it's like any job or institution. People do the wrong things or people may do things. But what you want in a society is that does the society have levers for accountability, for oversight, so that when people do wrong, there are pathways to check them. You're never going to find an institution or a society or a nation where they never do anything wrong or all the institutions never have a bad people or corruption. Law enforcement always does the right thing. That doesn't exist in human society. There's no utopia on this earth. So intelligence, you just have to see as the highest point of, of, of securing our nation. And if it's open to, you know, somebody who's, who's white, someone who's Asian, it should be open to anyone and you should bring the best that you can to that position. Excellent. Thank you for that. So we'll do a, a true speed speed round. Okay. okay. Uh, and we're going to start with our hopefully someday classic question of, of Malcolm or Martin. Well, not a surprise that I'm going to say Malcolm, but I will say, I mean, that, and it's actually kind of tough because I was actually thinking, you know, maybe I would say Martin, but, but Malcolm, because of um, the, the internal and personal moral clarity that Malcolm brought, I think Martin brings moral clarity on a societal level, definitely. Uh, but I think uh, Malcolm's journey and him accepting these universal human values is very inspirational and did impact me. Very good. And our, our second and last question, we'll, 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 we'll uh, change it up a little bit based on some of your writings and what I've read. Um, Boogie Down Productions or Public Enemy? Ooh, that is so good. I am so glad you asked. Because, yeah, I'm so glad you asked. I thought you were going to ask about Kanye and Jay-Z. And I was like, <laughs> oh, okay, good. <laughs> that, that is such a great one. But And for me... It's BDP, Boogie Down Productions. And the reason is, the reason it will always be, and KRS-One will be a great figure for me, because it was actually Boogie Down Productions from the South Bronx that um, first attracted, that first really raised my consciousness, that had me to start thinking about things. They had a song called You Must Learn, which was about learning like African American history and, and that sort of that. I mean, learn. you must learn. I mean, I remember it. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> when that came out, man, that was, that was my new mantra. That woke me up. You know, I mean, it woke me up in a lot of ways and not that I was like doing bad things, but it just made me want to take on more and yeah. it wanted, gave me more confidence. So Boogie Down Productions, definitely. All Super right. Oh, you. my gosh. All right. Well, we, we, we you already answered the Daryl question, but I, and, and we all need to go. But I do want to ask yeah. you just one quick and uh, try to keep it short. But mm. this tra- this the, the transition that you described with uh, I- Nation of Islam mm. or, or, or the other component, which said, you know what, we should be embracing the founding principles of America. Yeah. How do you compare that? How would that message today mm-hmm. resonate, do you think? Because there are many people who are questioning the founding principles of America, particularly the black community. So what would be your message 
to Daryl and other members of the black community in terms of whether or not our path forward is an embrace of America or a rejection of the founding principles? I would say that if you look at our history and the struggle that we had, the struggle and the success was only made possible because we actually uh, connected them to the principles of America's founding. And it was only through that framework that we could achieve freedom. If we were just saying, okay, you know, you know it's, we're, it's separate from America and America is evil, that you, how can, you can't really reform the system or expand the system. And so that's what I would say is that you have to just look at our history and what got us to where we are. It was a struggle, but th we, we believed in those principles that allowed us to then articulate the freedom that we wanted. So you can't reject that and you can't just say that it's evil. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here and we wouldn't have the success that we've had. All right. Well, yeah, yeah, Fanusi, thank you for that international, global. I love the fact that you're an undercover CIA agent. You played your you played your role really well. <laughs> I've been out of uh, government since you know twenty almost ten years. Uh, see, so the best uh, ties have the great <laughs> the best the great stories. All right, um, all right. Uh, thank you, viewer. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Invisible Men. My name is Ian Rowe. I'm Nike Ufajors. And if you'd like to see other episodes, please go to www.invisible.men. Yaya, great to see you. Thank you both. It was great talking with you. Thank you for watching another episode of The Invisible Men. You can find other episodes at the AEI podcast channel on YouTube or the website invisible.men or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. 